Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the meetup today. We're going to be talking about the RP2040 as an available and better alternative for your IoT projects. And today we have a very special guest. We have um, Roger Thornton, who is the Director of Applications at Raspberry Pi Foundation. He has also had a job as the principal hardware engineer at Raspberry Pi Foundation. And his skills include product management, innovation management, business development, strategy, leadership, and disruptive innovation. Great. So um, as, as, as uh, was mentioned, my name's Roger Thornton, and I work as director of applications uh, at Raspberry Pi. Really, my job and then my team's role is to help people put Raspberry Pi into commercial and industrial products. So where, where you take Raspberry Pi technology and use it to enable some other uh, bigger, bigger go. Um, today we'll talk a bit about uh, RP2040, which is Raspberry Pi's first foray into in the microcontroller space. Um, what I'll do is I'll give a bit of background about Raspberry Pi, which some of you might know about us, some of you might not. Um, sort of a, a bit of history about how we got to this position of, of, um, of, of, of offering microcontrollers. And then we'll take a kind of a, a look into what RP2040 is and what it does, um, a bit of the commercial side of it, so you understand how it fits into and compares to other microcontrollers out there. Uh, and then we'll, we'll round it out with um, a bit of Q&A, because uh, these things usually uh, um, spark off more questions, so um, we can... We can we can ask them. E equally, feel free to jump in and, and um, ask questions as we go along. Um, you know, please feel free you have to wait till the end. Great. So Raspberry Pi as a company has been around for 10 years. And um, we started off with the goal to help uh, uh, children who are learning computer science have access to general purpose computing and have access to a, a sort of a, a, a free and open computing platform that they could learn to program on. And that market, this, this is sort of the, the education market is where we first started. Um, and that was really where we got our start. Um, and that since exploded up into a, it's many different markets. And in the early days, we saw huge amounts of um, interest from sort of enthusiastic um, users of Raspberry Pi. So people who are taking Raspberry Pi and using it to build something in their house or, or learn about or, or create something on, a, on this low cost computing platform. And then over the years, it's transitioned and really we like to think of it as, as some people who were tinkering with Raspberry Pi, um, stopped, stopped, uh, stopped playing with it at home and took it into work and used it there instead. And so we were able to, to um, they sort of brought Raspberry Pi into the workplace and said, well, oh, well, we're using this $500 dollar computer when we could use this $35 PC instead. So really our, our low cost, PC platform has, has sort of started off in education and has grown into the industrial sector. Um, and that's where we've seen uh, the, the growth in the company over the last few years. The, the percentage of Raspberry Pi computers sold, um, you know, the, the number has gone on up and then the percentage of those computers sold into the industrial market has increased and increased. So now we're at around the 70% of the 7 million computers sold every year go into industrial uh, into commercial um, embedded applications. And that really sh is shown in our, in, our, in our product lineup. So um, for those familiar with Raspberry Pi, um, or, or those not, the top, the top board here, the, the single board computer, that, that is what the archetypal Raspberry Pi is. It's, um, it's our longest, longest running product. And it's the product that really made Raspberry Pi famous. So the, the single board computers are primary, uh, we call it our hero product. It is a product that we um, built the company around. And that is a single board computer. And we're onto our sort of fourth big generation, so Raspberry Pi 4 now, um, which um, has all the, all, all the ports and accessories that you'd expect from a, a, from a, 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 a desktop PC. And we are now getting close to desktop PC-like performance. But at a fraction of the cost, you know, it's thirty-five, thirty-five dollars and up. 
And then we have um, a compute module, which is the brains of the Raspberry Pi, but in a, an embeddable format. So this is a similar price point um, and similar feature set, but, but sort of um, uh, reduced into a much more easily embedded form factor. And, and that, that's been uh, widely, widely um, used in, in, in the embedded world. Then the, the, the product we launched after that, at a sort of similar time as the, the, the fourth generation, was this um, an all-in-one PC. So this is where we integrated all of Raspberry Pi's processing and uh, compute power into a piece, into a, uh, into a, uh, a, a sort of a desktop keyboard style uh, product. So the one in the middle there. And that, and that was really aimed at the consumer markets and the education markets. It's a, it's a kind of computer, uh, it's a Raspberry Pi in a, in a sort of much more um, handle, uh, easy to use form. You know, there's, it, it's not a bare board, it's getting in the case, and it, it um, sort of replaces uh, a desktop PC in time. We've seen good success in our accessory range. We, we started off not uh, being able to offer very many, but as the company's grown in size, we've been able to offer more accessories that plug into either into the single world computer or, or, or standalone. And um, we also see a huge number of other companies build and sell accessories for the Raspberry Pi. And really when we looked at all the, the products that we do, we do now offer, we offer embedded compute with the compute modules, we offer general purpose compute in our Singapore computers. Um, and we have a kind of consumer offering now in that, in that uh, all in one PC. What we didn't have was that very low end of um, uh, uh, embedded products uh, in the microcontroller world. Um, now we could have looked to buy a microcontroller from someone else to integrate it into products that we sell, but actually the decision was made that we think we could design and make a better microcontroller than, than anyone else out there. And that's where the idea to build a microcontroller came from. Um, it's been a six year project from start to, to, to actually releasing a, a chip. So it's a long commitment from Raspberry Pi to, to be building uh, you know, silicon custom designed by Raspberry Pi. And, and that's what we have released as our first one. So RP2040, which is our first microcontroller part product, um, was designed by Raspberry Pi. Um, and it was designed for people who use Raspberry Pi products in other in other parts of their, their their jobs so you know we like to say it was designed by engineers for engineers um, and we've um, launched it about 18 months ago but we are um, doing very well with it now, at the top level up 2040 is a dual core um, cortex m0 plus microcontroller it's got a large on-chip memory um, and it's, uh, it benefits from the, a large range of peripherals that you can you can mark onto the pins. But it also has this um, thing called PIO, which is a programmable I/O interface, which allows you to create state machines for interfaces and um, and generate any kind of uh, current or legacy interface. Now you can see RP twenty forty on the on the right of the screen there. It's a, it's a 56 pin QFN, uh, which is you know, relatively easy to pick a place and, and to solder onto a board by hand if you're, if you're relatively adept at soldering. Um, and we've seen it being picked up by uh, lots of other similar um, sort of enthusiast maker companies, as you'd expect. Um, and, and we also sell our own little uh, sort of development board as well called Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, and uh, quite nicely, actually, the uh, we, we launched our second version of Pico today, in fact, the Pico W, um, so, uh, which is uh, where it takes, it takes the Pico form factor and adds, and adds Wi-Fi. Here's a fairly in-depth look at how Raspberry Pi stacks up to other parts out there. Um, and it's noticeable that you know, we have the similar, similar, similar cores, but a, a higher clocking speed, uh, higher RAM on board um, and a higher support of, of, of flash, um, albeit externally. But um, I think the thing that we, you know, 
Um, I'll make these slides available so you don't have to digest all this information now. Um, but the thing we've, uh, we're, we're very good at at the moment um, is price and availability. So we are, um, unlike a lot of other microcontrollers out there, we are in stock and we are able to, to deliver a large volume of stock at the moment. Um, and it's been priced in the way that Raspberry Pi normally prices products, which is, which is very aggressively to try and make it open and accessible to everyone. And that's an example of uh, our pricing position and where we can, uh, what, what we listed for, it's around a dollar to, to people or um, about 70 cents to um, in, in large volume. And we've got around three, we've shipped around three million pieces and we have about two million pieces on hand. So you could you could order a real almost today and have it later, this, later, later in the month. Um, we mentioned a bit about Pico. Um, Pico is uh, our, our our development board project uh, development board. It um, breaks out all the opinions on on uh, on the, uh, the the chip and um, allows you to take use of all the peripherals. Um, a way to uh, to purchase Raspberry Pi RB twenty forty um, is uh, we have a direct business model now so you can you can pay with um you can you can order through us direct and we sell picos we sell rp2040 and we also sell uh windbond flash which is the external flash for, for rp2040 and and really the the, the big thing about uh, uh pi is that um about pico uh, about rp2040 is that it's um it's designed to work really well on Raspberry Pi as a development environment. So you can buy a Raspberry Pi, um, all the tool chain and, and so on is free to, to pick up there. And then it works very well with, with, with Raspberry Pi. So there's a, a fully supported C and C++ SDK on Raspberry Pi. Um, and there's also MicroPython support. Um, we even uh, wrote a book, which you can get for free, should you be interested in, 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 uh, in reading about uh, how to use my private on RP2040. Um, and we give that book away free online. Now, one thing we've been, been told about um, from, from the market is that there's uh, support for some of the more um, sort of uh, legacy or sort of the sort of historic compilers isn't, isn't there, but we are working on giving support for, for compilers, uh, for, for other compilers on, on Windows, but there is already support for Visual Studio. Uh, Um, that's a, a brief overview, I'd say, of, of, of RP2040. Um, I, I'm very happy to take some questions, or I can go into some areas in more detail uh, as, 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 as required. Um, I really sort of open up the, the field to, to any questions you have about RP2040 and, and its use. Um, you might leave the, uh, the spec sheet up so that we can, we can talk around them. Um, uh, Perhaps, um, or I can go into some more detail about some of the some of the features uh, as people would see. Great, Roger. I'd like to ask a question first. Um, so, why did uh, Raspberry Pi decide to take uh, the journey into developing your own silicone? Um, maybe just speak a little bit around that, especially when the market has quite a few alternatives. Maybe you can just speak to um that a little bit more thank you uh, of course uh, i can go back into detail on that so when we looked at our product lineup and as i mentioned from this slide um we had a good offering in the single product in the single board computer market and we had a good offering in the embedded computer market but what we didn't have was a good solution to microcontrollers um we, we couldn't find a microcontroller out there that we would be happy to build a board around and we believe that we uh, as a as a as a company with our design philosophy could instill that that the sort of the, the feature set and approach to business model that we have with Raspberry Pi in the microcontroller business. I mean the microcontroller business is a vast business. It's 27 billion microcontrollers are sold every year. And they they range from very bespoke um, you know 
automotive safety controllers down to very, very basic 8-bit micros. But what we can see is this, this coalescing of, of microcontrollers, that the 8-bit and 16-bit parts used to be the cheapest thing you could buy and, and would do some very basic uh, piece of um, function. But their market share was going eroding and eroding, given over to these 30-bit, 32-bit micros. And we believe that was where sort of the perfect place was for us to, to, to position ourselves, is to have a 32-bit micro in this sort of sub-dollar region would be um, a similar shock to the market as, as the Raspberry Pi was to the computing market. You know, up until Raspberry Pi came out, the idea of a, a, a computer less than two three hundred dollars was was sort of out of the question. And Raspberry Pi came along and showed the market that it could could um, it could that the, the good quality computing was available at less. And that's what we believe we can do with, with RP 2040. And it's also part of our idea that, you know, Raspberry Pi can make products like Pico and Pico W that are microcontroller based products. Um, and rather than having to buy someone else's microcontroller, we can buy our own. And it's the, it's the microcontroller we want to see on these kind of development boards. So that's really, hopefully that gives you an idea of why, why that market's interesting and why we, um, we've done, you know, Building a chip team is not a small undertaking, but it's it's helped us deliver a very competitive product into um, a very interesting market. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Perhaps it's worth um, one thing I, I touched on, which I perhaps should should cover a bit more is is uh, PIO, which is our programmable uh, interface. Um, one of the things that you probably find with microcontrollers is that if you want a certain interface or a set of a certain um, combination of interfaces, you might be you know, stuck in terms of microcontroller selection. So, um, you know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of very common interfaces that you might expect on there: SPI, I2C, I2S, um, UARTs, and things like that. Um, but some of the more sort of um, obscure older uh, interfaces or perhaps uh, something that isn't perhaps quite an interface but just needs some logic behind it. Um, PIO is, is the ideal solution for that. So PIO is a set of state machines that you can program, which allows you to basically create an interface protocol of your choice. So we've seen quite a lot of companies use it to interface to older equipment, things that don't have, things that, um, have interface standards that aren't used anymore. You could build a build a PIO interface in, or perhaps you um, just have a very strong requirement for many, many more SPI interfaces or something like that. You can actually build more in, in, in PIO. So it gives you that flexibility around choice so that you could pick pick up 2040 and then, then, then worry about the interface spec rather than the other way around, which is to discount, discount a controller because it doesn't, include particular interface and, and add in that other one. Great, thank you. I think we can proceed unless there are any more questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the floor's open to questions about RP2040 if there are any, um, or if you'd like me to go into detail about anything else. I'm very happy to. Hi, Roger. Hi. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. We just have uh, two questions about the RP2040. So one of them is uh, in terms of power consumption, uh, is it ideal for low power devices? Because uh, we use something like the NRF52848. 52840 and also 52832, and they're quite good when it comes to you know uh, low power applications. And um, also about the lifetime of the product, I, I didn't maybe I missed it, but uh, what is expected lifetime? Like oh, when is the end of life of the RP2040 expected to be? Of course. So um, on power, our RP2040 is our first first part. In, in the microcontroller roadmap, should we say. 
and, and it's not optimized for, for very low power um, products. So things that uh, would need to run exclusively off a battery rather than battery backed plus, plus, play, you know, plus wall power, should we say. Um, exclusive battery use of, of, of different, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not going to compete with those, those parts that you, you listed, you know, the sort of the, the, the parts that are able to go into very deep sleep. We don't have that uh, ability on ARP2040. So really it's, it's parts that, you know, it, it, it's, it's best placed in applications which have either a reliable, reliable yeah, you know, a charge up cycle or, or have a connection to sort of fixed power. Um, but something that, that you expect to sort of run off a coin cell or off a, a AA battery for a prolonged period of time. Um, it, it's not, not ideal for that. That's not to say it won't, you know, we won't have a part that does that. So uh, it's already been one of the things asked for is, is, and, and being worked on is a low power version of, of ARP2014 that will come in, in the future. In terms of lifetime, um, we pride, pride itself on, on sort of keeping products going for a prolonged period of time. You know, um, that you as, a, as, as engineers who design things in will have no doubt been uh, bitten at some point by, by someone uh, declaring end of life of some critical part of, of the design. Um, so to that end, uh, Raspberry Pi has never discontinued a, a product. So you can still buy the very first Raspberry Pi that we produced 10 years ago, should you, should you wish. Um, and to that end, uh, up to 2040 at the moment has a lifetime up to, up to 2030. So, so another, another nine years from now. Um, but if you look at our, our, our website, gives our, our end of life dates, they, they regularly are, are updated and, and increased. Um, so we, we, we keep, keep updating them as we go along. Okay, thank you, that answers my questions. Uh, Roger, I, I have one more question. Um, because uh, RP2040 is a dual core um, device, in which applications um, have you seen um, other designers uh, leverage um, two cores um, to increase optimization of their solution? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, both cores can be run independently on and, and run from separate bits of memory. So you can actually run two separate things. So you see a lot of people use one core for running an application and one running sort of watchdogs and secure and safety things. So you can have two cores doing two separate things. Um, so uh, places like uh, places where you want to run an app, uh, two separate applications on a microcontroller or um, you know, just use one, you, know, you don't need to use both at the same time. Um, we, we've seen it picked up um, a lot in embedded um, control projects. So things like, um, industrial controllers and um, things that are one of, one of the biggest places we're doing is, is sort of just replacing obsolete or, or, or sort of um, un, unobtainable parts. So that, that, that varies from um, washing machines to to um, uh, to, to key key card um, readers and things like that. Just where people need a an available and, and, and sort of uh, reliable microcontroller. Thank you. Uh, okay, on, on that uh, note that uh, Latif uh, just raised, uh, uh, are there any maybe simple machine learning algorithms that can be run on the RP2040? Just very simple bare metal. Uh, Yep, so Tiny ML have done, done some work with ARP2040. There's some libraries out there that support some, some machine learning um, style applications on, on the part. There's no, um, there's no dedicated, dedicated um, hardware to accelerate ML, but there is, there is um, ports of some common machine learning um, uh, applications on, on ARP2040. And I, I can um, share some of them um, I can share it with uh, the host of this and they can send it on to you all if that's of interest. Okay, thank you. So I think one of the questions uh, many of the developers uh, would like to know 
when they're building IoT devices and they need to connect their device to the cloud, you know, to stream data, um, one of the things that they're looking for is connectivity, you know, and that's the one thing that RP2040 doesn't have on board. And you just mentioned that you have uh, new versions of the Pico uh, coming out. Is that something that is uh, down the pipeline for RP to have embedded um, communications on the chip um, down down on the roadmap? Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, uh, as you mentioned, today we launched a product called, uh, called Pico W, which is uh, Raspberry Pi, um, Raspberry Pi Pico, plus um, uh, a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip from, from Infineon. Um, and then that's really the, the, you know, the biggest request when we had when we launched Pico was can it, can it have networking of some sort? Um, I think there is a, a high high uh, high uh, demand for integrating the, the radio into the, the microcontroller itself. Um, one of the big questions is what technology that is. You know, uh, and, and I'd, I'd love to hear from, from, from the attendees here, like you know, what radio is the preferred method for connecting IoT devices to them? You know, I guess with Wi-Fi, you are, you're skipping out the, the you know, you're, you're, you're sort of, um, it's quite a, a common deployment and you could uh, deploy it into uh, you know, pretty much any, any sort of um, factory or thing like that, because they typically have a Wi-Fi network. Um, but is there another what is another another radio standard that people are interested in or, or seeing a lot of demand for that would be interesting to use? Hi, Roger. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'd like to yeah just to speak a bit on that. So uh, from from our perspective, we have uh, of course uh, the GSM, the typical GSM radios that uh, you know support the SIM card integration. Uh, we'd we'd like to know you know what what kind of plans you you have for for that in particular. And then you know as the comments come in as well, we have requests for LP1 support. Uh, of course, uh, Laura. Uh, sub gigahertz, sub gigahertz, uh, you know, from Texas Instruments, we have the Sigfox network and the likes. And of course, Wi Fi, you know, given that they, the all the other Raspberry Pi models support Wi Fi already. So I think that should come, that should come as, uh, as an automatic one. Yep. Thank you. I can figure, I, I, yeah, I think, no, sorry. Oh, just go ahead. I think I'll ask my question after you. Sorry, I, I, was someone going to ask a question there? Ah. Okay, so just asking. My question was about the SDK that you mm -hmm. presented on. So you talked about two calls that are available for development and application layer development. So just trying to ask. Is there currently support available in the SDK for real-time operating system? Is for there, what is there there? RTOS, so real-time operating system. Yes, so there are some uh, RTOS available on, on RP2040. Uh, I think free RTOS is sort of the, 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 the most widely used. Um, so there is, there is support there, and we are sort of growing our support and, and trying to work with sort of the... the, the uh, most commonly used uh, RTOS uh, out there to, to sort of get their support to, to port to RP2040 as well. Um, but if there's an RTOS that you think would be particularly useful, I'd love to hear. Uh, most probably, I think one, since you're trying to head uh, integrating communication in the SOC, so I think Zephyr would be one preferable kind of alternative. To pre Zephyr. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And perhaps a, a question for, for, for all of you out there um, is, is sort of um, what's your typical development environment? Yeah, what's your sort of 
compiler or, or tool chain that you use um, that, that you sort of uh, see as the uh, sort of standard that you would use with with uh, the you know, like the, the sort of the Nordics, the STs, and, and if, if there's a something that you you particularly use as well, that's something good to know for for us as well. Like we have a sh some shy developers um, today. But I think um, <laughs> a lot of the uh, the environment that uh, people use to develop um, is actually on the Arduino uh, IDE um, because a lot of us are transitioning from um, eight bit uh, at megas into more uh, capable MCUs. But we really would like to hear um, from you uh, guys directly. Uh, what IDE are you using? Which IDE are you uh, planning to move to? So uh, just raise your hand and uh, we'll select so we're not all talking uh, over each other. Uh, I think someone's got a hand engineer, <laughs> happily named. Hello, this is Nicholas. Eh? Hello. Hello. So my, my, my question is on uh, the Pico W, which you said you've launched today. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned it, it contains uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi module on it. Uh, I, I, I had a charge on a certain project whereby uh, I was required to connect to two networks. And hence, I had to do some uh, network management. With the ESP, it was a bit critical, no, no, not easy. Uh, are, you, are you planning to develop some uh, APIs maybe for network management, whereby I, I can configure two networks, and when one fails, it has a fallback to the second one? So this would be connecting to two different Wi-Fi networks? Two different or three different Wi-Fis. Then if one is not active, it falls back to the other. Because on the on the ESP, there's a bit some bit of issues there. Uh, I don't think there should be an issue of doing that on ours. You know, you can just give it SSIDs to try and connect to, and should that fail, switch over to another one. So, um, but that should be no problem with our with our new part that we've launched. No, then on on this pick of the one you launched earlier, uh, I have. Uh, I've tried a few things, the I2C network any communication, the ISP communication, but I had an issue with the run pin on the module, whereby when I tried to extend the, the reset button, the module could not power up. It kept on resetting continuously. I think uh, maybe noise or something. Oh, so when you try and reset the module, it, it, just, it just sits in a constant, continual reset loop. Yes, I tried to extend the, the run pin with some wires to, to a reset button. Then I, I could not even run the module. It kept on resetting, resetting, resetting. I, I, I experienced the same issue with uh, the interrupt example on the CSDK. Yeah. When I tried to activate an interrupt, uh, to read an interrupt from a pin, the module kept on resetting. It could not read anything. Mm. Um, I can't think of why it would, what, why adding some wires to a pin like that would cause a, a reset, unless something like the power was getting, you know, sort of yeah. running out the power or something like that, that, you know, the, the, the extra IR drop into cables perhaps, um, or creating some strange ground bound situation. But, you know, I, I, if it's something that's continually dogging you, um, I, I think the best thing for you to do is to email the, the email address on the on the screen there, applications at raspberry.com, and and someone can can help you uh, get to the bottom of what's going on. If you have we talked about uh, having an and also having a communication Wi-Fi communication with that. So my question would be with regards to over there update to support for that. So is that kind of, kind of inbuilt into the SDK or does an application developer have to do their sort of embedded bootloader 
for that separate from what's provided in the SDK. So we provide a we provide a bootloader for you um, that you can you can take advantage of, and um, but much like much like all Raspberry products, we allow you the chance to do whatever you like. You know, so you you can build build your own thing as well. Um, so the SDK gives you that flexibility to sort of uh, build build take your own or build 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 your own. Um, in case anybody is wondering. Um how to get your hands on RP2040. Uh, we, are, we do have RP2040s in stock right here at Gearbox Europlacer. So for the designers who are building PCBs, um, we can help you with that. And also in the month of July, um, culminating in an open day on July 30th, um, we'll be providing more information and training on how do you transition your designs from you know, at Megas um, to RP2040. So please feel free to reach out to us um, so we can help uh, help you get started on that transition and to see if this uh, MCU will work well for you. Okay. Uh, there's a question in the chat, which I, I can answer, which was uh, how to get, get a hand of, hold of this book, um, the, the sort of getting started with Pika book. Um, it's on our website, which I will um, ensure we send a link to. Um, but if you just search for MicroPython on Raspberry Pi uh, with, uh, in Google, you, you'll get presented with our, our, our bookstore. Uh, you can buy a hard copy of it, you know, a printed version of it, and we can send it to you, or you can get a free digital version uh, as well, so you can get access to that information for free as well. So, hey, hey Roger. A uh, quick question as well is uh, you know, we're hoping also to get some uh, maybe a highlight or showcase of some of the you know the products that have been built on the RP twenty forty already. Yeah, so um, uh, I can. There's a, a few examples of of products here. These are these are other make sort of sort of the other development boards that uh, companies like SparkFun and and um, Adafruit have brought out. Um, You'll probably know that uh, Arduino, if, you're, if, you're, if you guys are all using Arduino as well, Arduino have an RP20 version, uh, RP2040 version as well, that you can, you can pick up. Um, and then um, I couldn't give you company details, but um, sort of rough markets that, that they're being picked up into. Um, things like uh, gate, uh, it's like door access, people are using um, RP2040 to control. Um, uh, and then they're also appearing in industrial control units inside factories so things like plcs um, and then equally as, as as control logic inside um consumer white goods like, like dishwashers and things like that and um, between forces are turning up in so they're, they're really being much like um how it's always that endlessly fascinating about where raspberry pi turns up um you know rp2040 is already starting to do that and it's appearing some some great places all right, thank you. Equally, if, if you are um, not sure about how to articulate your question at the moment, but we'll, we'll want to get in touch, um, uh, I'll find out more about RP2040. Um, our website has uh, the data sheets on it, which, is, um, which has been very highly recommended by uh, people. And they say, actually, written a data sheet that's uh, readable and, and has the right information in it. Um, that can all be found at raspberrypi.com. Um, along, along with it is, um, uh, if you're a layout engineer or, or, or hardware engineer, uh, we give uh, a reference schematic and layout on that page, or, or, on our website, so that you can, you can get started. And you can, in fact, we give away the Pico schematics and layout, so that you could take that and then adapt it to your design very quickly. Um, and uh, should you get stuck, there's uh, the email address for, for my team is applications at raspberrypi.com and we can help you uh, help you with any any further questions there. Oh, there's a good, good question here. Um, of what challenges do you foresee for those who wish to transition from other chips? Um, the, the first one will be that you'll have to, to relay your board out, board out. So uh, RP2040 doesn't share a common footprint with any other microcontroller out there. So there is a, there is a piece of Layout work done. Um, uh, RP2040 doesn't take doesn't have any onboard flash memory, so you you'll need to have external flash. So 
that could be an issue if you have a, a, a size constraint or, or, or sort of a, have a part that had traditionally had flash in, in, inside it. Um, we'd like to think that we've made the software transition relatively easy. Um, it might be a case that you're used to using a compiler or, or tool chain development tool chain that we don't fully 100% support at the moment, but we have been listening to people and, and, and we are doing a lot of work to try and support the uh, support tool chains that everyone else has out there. Um, uh, I think another challenge you might have is what to do with all your extra money that you're left with because uh, you're not spending it all on, on microcontrollers after, after spending a lot less on ARC 2040. You know, ARC 2040 is a much cheaper part. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, our biggest uh, piece of work to do is to find out what is catching people out. So if you hit something that you, 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 you um, or have a worry about something, please let me know, because that's the really, in, in, um, really important thing for us to do, to understand. Um, so please, please get in touch if you are concerned that a certain piece of um, the design journey isn't gonna, it means you're not going to be able to, to transition over there. So there's a question from Evelyn. Um, and Evelyn's asking, are we likely to confront any overheating issues with uh, Pi or RP2040? Um, so uh, RP2040 is, is much like any other microcontrollers. There's, there's sort of very little um, heavy duty processing power in there compared to a microprocessor. You know, there's not these um, huge, uh, huge ARM cores or large graphics cores that, that do generate a lot of heat and, and consume a lot of power. So you know, typically we don't see, we wouldn't expect to see any heat issues with our, with a with a microcontroller product. You know, the PCB and the package themselves will probably act, will probably do nearly all your heat dissipation, and, and you know it's very unlikely and very rare to see sort of uh, active cooling solutions on microcontrollers. Um, it could that question could be referring to to Raspberry Pi computers in general, um, and you know. We do, um, you know, you are able to find synthetic benchmarks and things like that, which will cause the processor to, to heat up. Um, and and well, what we do do is we throttle back, um, throttle back arm frequencies and and and, and lower the vo voltage to, to to reduce power consumption uh, on the on these parts. Um, and and. In some, if you're in a particularly uh, like a high ambient temperature environment, running compute intensive things, active cooling is probably going to be needed. Uh, thank you. Maybe um, uh, Roger, because you've done this uh, for a while, especially uh, coming through developing Pi and uh, RP2040. If you could just speak a little bit about where you think the future is on um, hardware development um, around, especially around IoT, and where, where do you think the the new trends will be coming in the industry? Um, just to give, give us an idea of what you know what's coming down the pipeline. Of course. Um, so the, the IoT has been around for a, a, a long time now, and um, it's slowly delivering on what it promised. It hasn't quite got there yet. Um, the the interesting thing about IoT, I think, is that um, there's, been, there's been a slow um, move away from the idea that the whole point of IoT was to, to gather data up and then send it to some central place and then do vast computational work on it to, to work out trends from that data or be able to um, automate a bunch of actions that you wouldn't normally be able, be able to coordinate um, by having uh, remote things. So this idea of, of uh, gathering data, sending it to the cloud, doing something with it, and then sending back an action, um, I think we're slowly seeing a shift away from, mainly because the price of, uh, of compute has gone down. So it used to be that you could just put expensive compute in the cloud and then just have sort of relatively um, simple devices at the air, uh, sort of at the sensor node, collecting data and sending it to the network. But what I think we found is that the cost of sending things to the cloud has, hasn't come down as much as you'd expect it to. Um, you know, 
if you can get a wired connection, so if you can get an ethernet to a gateway and then develop some sort of local gateway like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth or LoRa, then sort of you've got that, that thing. But if you are in a truly remote sense that you, know, you need to get your data up through the cloud, through something like, through, through a mobile network like GSM or something, that cost is quite high still. And it's cost in silicon, it's cost in, in, in battery life, but it's a, a cost in actually sort of the data transition costs. And so I think there's a shift, and, and we've seen it ourselves, is the shift to sort of edge computing, where the, the, the algorithm you expect to run on your data doesn't change, whether it's run locally or run, run, on, run on the cloud. And you run, you run your algorithm on some enhanced compute node. So we're seeing a lot of people with Pi, you know, Raspberry Pi is running, running some edge compute on them. Uh, and then having a, a wider range of, of sensors on a local network there. And then all you do is you send bits of information from that edge node to the cloud saying, you know, this is how th this algorithm has worked and this, this is how this is processed well. And, and you, sort of, uh, you sort of distribute that compute network a bit. And I think that's what we're seeing more is as the cost of, of general purpose compute goes down, the, the, the ease of using edge computing goes up. Um, and you have sort of you have you still have a traditional IoT network. It's just where the computing is done is is different. Okay, so I think that's that's really interesting, and uh, maybe uh, the rest of the engineers can can uh, provide their feedback on this because what we're facing um, here, especially uh, uh, in East Africa or the continent, is one we don't have access to. Uh, widely distributed IoT favorable communication networks to access to cloud um, cloud coverage is quite expensive, right? So if we're trying to leverage IoT to solve problems in remote areas, um, it, it gets to be quite challenging. So um, what we're looking for is how can we bridge that gap? How do we not only bridge it, leap that gap? Um, so any, any ideas that you may have um, that you think would help uh, would be, we'll be glad to hear. And um, yeah, so yeah, maybe the rest of the team can, can, can feed in as well. Thank you. I, I think, I think the, the key to solving this is to um, build a network as such that it can, it can act remotely, act, act autonomously for prolonged periods of time. And then when a, when a, when a connection is possible, rather than uploading all the raw data, which, which is particularly expensive in, in these kinds of situations, being able to upload a summary or, or sort of a, uh, a result of an algorithm's output, you know, that, you know, that, that compresses a month's worth of sensor data from the network into a small packet of, a sort of a small learning, uh, a sort of, you know, sort of a distilled learning from that data. Um, I think that's the way really around a bridge it is, is to rely on uh, sort of semi-autonomous nodes that run your, your desired application for a period of time and then upload the results of that rather than, rather than trying to get all the data up to the cloud to then get all the, get all the actions back down off it. You know, allow these nodes to run autonomously for a period of time and report back how they got on rather than all the data. Um, I, 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 you're exactly right, which is, is unless you have a very reliable, cheap way of getting data into the cloud, it, the, the, the sort of the, the uh, traditional IoT network doesn't work very well. Um, and that's probably where it has fallen down, is that you know, the, the grand vision of IoT was that everything's connected everywhere. Actually, it's quite hard to achieve with any reasonable um, sort of cost efficiency. We're getting close to the eight o'clock mark. Um, any other questions? Uh, I've got a, there's a question in the chat here. Um, uh, a question around design patent regulations on our chips. Um, in the sense that you, uh, there is no restriction on using our, our chips. So you are free to buy them and implement them as, as you see fit. Uh, and there's no ongoing royalties or anything like that. So the, the price for buying our chips is, is, is on our website and 
that is really the price and that there's no other sort of ongoing um, uh, ongoing cost or anything like that. And, and, and there's no, um, you know, unless you start reverse engineering in our chip, there's no issues. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's no um, regulations on our use of our chips. So you, much like Russell Pye, we, we, we encourage their use in as many places as do. Roger, it's Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, Roger, I was just going to add to that. Uh, not, not reference design, patent regulations, but there is export controls. Uh, our, all of our product is controlled by US export controls. So currently that means any board you make with our product cannot be exported to uh, places like Russia, for example, at the moment, North Korea, Pakistan, you know, any, any controlled uh, country by US exports. So you cannot produce a product and export it uh, to a US controlled, uh, a US sanctioned uh, country. I'm sure that wasn't your intention, but just it's just worth adding that. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um, Roger, from because uh, we do have a lot of young engineers on the call, um, if uh, an engineer wanted to get into um, developing silicone or, or get into that journey, um, what do you suggest um, that path would look like? And I'm understanding that paths, career paths are different for everyone. Maybe just uh, give some insight on, on your path and on how you got to be where you are. Um, that might be insightful for somebody learning. Of course, um, I myself, I'm not a, a trained chip designer. No, I, I, I don't do very much at all in, in the chip design world. I, you know, I, I'm a hardware engineer by training, so I design uh, computers. So I design, you know, I, I, I designed uh, previous versions of, of the Raspberry Pi computer. Um, and, you know, I got into it because... Um, well, I was very lucky. I sort of did some some work placements, and that's what got me my my sort of um, in, in into it. Um, but you know, for chip design, it, it's a tricky one because there is a, yeah, it's uh, it's quite highly specialized. But at the at the fundamental level of of all these things is just an understanding of of how uh, systems work. So teaching, uh, learning things like a programming language is really important. Learning about uh, computer architecture is really important. And we do offer some free books on that around the architecture of how a computer works and how, how, how these systems interact. And I think computer science and, and doing some computer science um, learning is, is a really great way to get into the chip design world because it's um, it teaches you how a computer works. And then once you know how a computer works, it's, you can then think about how you would implement that on silicon. And um, so, so getting getting used to and getting interested in um, computer architecture is, is is probably a really good way to, way to start. And then and then yeah, you know, most of chip design is simply it's a, a different type of programming language. Yeah, um, it's just a programming language that you use to describe cell, you know, chip chip um, chip architecture that's then synthesized by complicated programs into a set of transistors. So, you know, having a good grounding in, 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 in um, programming and in computer science is a great place to start. Great, thank you. Um, any last questions for Roger? And by the way, we also have Mike on the call. Mike is the uh, commercial manager for Raspberry uh, Pi, who's actually visited Nairobi, Kenya twice this year. Um, so we've been lucky to have him uh, uh, come and see us at Gearbox. Um, so any other questions at all? Um, okay. uh, we also have on the call um, Ken, Ken Okolo, who's uh, the strategy uh, uh, manager for Raspberry Pi for Africa. Um, so Ken sits in Lagos, Nigeria and is really looking to grow the Raspberry Pi business uh, across the continent, you know, helping us uh, engineers, designers um, solve the problems that we're facing 
um, every day using technology. So maybe Ken, just a quick introduction. I'm sure there are a couple of, uh, quite a few people who don't know your face uh, that would be glad to, to meet you. Hello everyone. Nice to be here. Ken, just like uh, Latif mentioned, and all the things he said, truly are things that are part of my remit in terms of um, looking at the African continent, um, getting the Raspberry Pi brand out there, as well as the products and really supporting um, engineers on the continent. Fantastic visits that we've had, um, both in January and in May visits in Nairobi and really seeing how vibrant the uh, sort of um, hardware engineering community is. Um, uh, and, and really excited to continue to work with you guys and partner with you guys on, on events like this. And also looking forward to the July 30 in-person events, I think somewhere around that. Uh, hope to be in Nairobi personally for that event um, as well. But great, great stuff, um, Latif, Roland, and uh, the entire Gearbox community um, for putting this, this sort of stuff together. Um, looking forward to partnering in this in this manner in, in future uh, type events. Thanks, Letty.